بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We carry on with ayat 261 of Surah Al-Baqarah, which begins as a topic uh, the next um, dozen or so ayats to talk about Sadaqah. which is of course a, v- a key concept and, and uh, feature of Islam and uh, then after that the remaining ayats of Surah Al-Baqarah continue on the economic theme dealing with the question of interest dealings uh, zakat, um, loans uh, and the, the need to uh, make a written record of transactions and so on before then um, uh, the surah closes off uh, with a prayer. These ayats on Sataka cover all the different aspects related to the topic, so it's quite comprehensive. That's why there's quite a number of ayats dealing with that, which also indicates the importance of the issue. So to start with, Allah says in ayat 261, the example of those who spent their wealth in the way of Allah is like that of a seed which grows seven ears, each ear containing a hundred seeds. And Allah gives increase for whom he pleases, and Allah is generous and knows. Spending the wealth in the way of Allah, of course, some relate this entirely to spending money on jihad. Some have a more uh, general view of anything that you spent for the pleasure, for the uh, uh, for um, the reward you get from Allah uh, is in the way of Allah. So depending on that, you get a little bit a different interpretation because uh, when Allah gives this example of people who spent money, um, and again in those ayats there is sometimes uh, the debate whether they relate to zakat or sadaqah in other words to the compulsory spending or whether they relate to um, the voluntary additional spending um, and again depending on that there are there are some different views that emerge but generally Allah gives us an example of how beneficial giving is that whatever you give multiplies and has much more of an impact than just what you give. Every little thing you give has a manifold impact. And of course again we can either look at the impact as the one in the hereafter, it has a manifold reward like that, or we can look at the benefit it does in this world, because everything you give enables somebody else to do something, which again, so there is that chain reaction. And the Example or simile that Allah uses is that of a seed growing seven ears, each ear containing a hundred seeds. That's why some commentators say this is the millet seed, because the millet seed apparently has a hundred seeds in each ear of, um, uh, of, of that, that plant. Um, there are some other seeds, be it wheat or be it whatever, uh, have different numbers of seeds in them, some more, some less. But I don't think the exact figure is what is intended here. We've talked about that before, that seven in itself. Why does it grow seven ears? Well, seven is a number for many. Seven indicates an infinite possibility very often as as a number. And so uh, any little you give results in a lot more, which then again multiplies even beyond that. So, one little seed, and of course uh, Allah often uses examples from the natural world that we're familiar with, or that at least people used to be familiar with. Uh, It's only in recent days that people live in such an artificial world that they don't know where things grow anymore, other than on supermarket shelves. So, um, maybe it's difficult now for people to understand his analogy, but it is a very very easy to understand um, um, that uh, in a way 
what we've been taught here is that not everything is a one-for-one -one exchange. It's not like you give something and get an equal amount back. But uh, when you start something, it is the beginning of a process. And that process uh, increases the effect again and again. It's like an ongoing sadaqa, particularly. Uh, people don't benefit from it once, but generations even benefit from it. If you plant a tree, or if you dig a well, or uh, if you open up a, a um, charitable institution for education, or whatever, or a place for people to, to, to um, find shelter or food. Um, it has an ongoing effect even way beyond our own lifespan if, if we do that. So here is this example, one seed creates uh, grows seven uh, ears which are packed with seeds again, a hundred each. Um, so progressively what you see is it starts to multiply slowly and then more and more because of these hundred, each of them again, of course, grows again something. And so it becomes exponential even. Uh, whereas Allah says then, He gives increase for whom He pleases. And there is a discussion, does that mean it can increase beyond the 700? Because those who say it's about jihad say, well, normally a good deed is ten times the reward, but if you spend on jihad, then it's 700 times the reward. And then, but if He increases to whom He pleases, then maybe some and now we get into on, on whose account was this uh, ayat revealed and uh, on which occasion, who gave what and that there may be the increase is even more than 700 because of its unique, uh, you know, if, if they were giving everything and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, I think it has a much more general meaning because that applies to any good deed and not just with regard to jihad. And there is a progressive increase and you don't know the limit. You cannot say it only goes that far and there it stops. You don't know how much good a good deed can cause as a follow-up effect. You can't count it, you can't stop it. It's a little bit like one seed of a plant may settle somewhere and then it spreads. You don't need to do anything. If it grows well, if it falls in fertile soil, it spreads and spreads and spreads and there is no uh, there, there is no uh, containing it or stopping it or say it must stay in this field or that field. It, the wind carries it and it goes beyond. And Allah is generous, He says, and so He wants us to be generous. And He knows. He knows what people give and so it doesn't uh, go missing, it doesn't get wasted. Um, it's not like uh, he can't keep count of it, even we can't. We can't see how far it goes, but he does. And that theme gets continued in Ayat 262. Um, we get a few qualifications now in the following Ayats of how to spend, whom to spend on, and so on, after having that basic principle of, of saying how good it is to spend. In ayah 262, Allah says, those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah without following their expenditure with reproach and insult, they will have the reward with the Lord and shall have no fear nor be sad. So again, people who spend their wealth, what they have, in the, or part of it, of course, it doesn't mean all of it necessarily, uh, from or of their wealth, um, in the way of Allah, without following their expenditure with reproach and insult. So if you give, and you give for the sake of Allah and hoping for a reward, then make it such that you don't give grudgingly. So we told there are different kinds of giving, and one is approved by Allah and the other isn't. If you give because you want to please Allah, you don't want anything back in return. You don't want thanks from people, you don't want your name hung up above the door in big letters that he gave this and that or uh, so much and um, uh, you're not going to hold it against the recipient. 
So we have this reproach and insult, um, which are the first one is basically either reminding people that you that they are in your debt. If you give something, it's not a loan, it's a gift, it's a sadaqah. And you shouldn't remind people of that, well, I did this and that for you, and you've got to remember that, and you should respect me for it and all that. Uh, or telling so many people that eventually the word goes round and comes back to the recipient, uh, so bragging about it basically, and makes him feel bad because everybody knows that he's been receiving something. Um, so that's the one category. And it's something thoroughly disliked. There are hadiths that make it quite clear that uh, if you do that, it's something that gets between you and Jannah. It's something that, that uh, really spoils all the reward, as the following ayats will also show. Um, as the old proverb says, it, uh, if you give something in charity, throw it in the river. I mean, let it flow away, let it go. Don't look after it, don't think of it, don't remember it, don't mention it. Uh, it's gone. Uh, insult is when you give something uh, and ridicule or belittle or make the recipient feel bad about it. So you give it with a remark like, here you, you know, here you go, I take this seeing you um, so desperate for it, or uh, any kind of, of um, uh, negative remark you would make with it, where you, where you uh, hurt, because the, ter the Arabic term actually implies hurt, where you hurt somebody's feelings. Then, if you don't want to give, don't give. Rather than giving, only people who don't look for the reward from Allah, who actually have other motives. They might give just to be seen, but at the same time put a word in because they, they do it for people's acknowledgement rather than uh, out of generosity. Um, and, and they remind everybody about it and so on. If you give sadaqah, then you don't want anything from it. You don't need anybody to know. You don't need something from the recipient either, neither acknowledgement nor anything back, because after all you do it for Allah, not for anybody else. So that kind of giving is not a proof, but for those who spent without doing that, they will get the reward with the Lord. Their reward is guaranteed. Their effort is not wasted. In other words, if you spoil it, it's not sadaqah. So be careful how you give. If you want reward, then make it clean. Don't cause bad feeling at the same time. And if you do that, then you also needn't worry. We, we've been through that phrase many times now. Have no fear nor be sad. You needn't worry about the future. You needn't uh, regret the past. You can be safe in the knowledge that Allah repays that generosity. If you can't give, now we have in ayah 263, but you're being asked, then we have a decent word and forgiveness are better than charity followed by insult, and Allah is rich and gentle. So if you can't give and you find it difficult, don't give and then put a remark in or grudgingly something. You better, a decent word here means a prayer. You say to somebody, well, I hope somebody uh, can manage to help you, I'm sorry I can't, or uh, uh, may Allah give you this and that, may Allah make it easy for you, a prayer, and, and forgiveness, yes, you say, well, um, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, I can't help you here, and um, it's better than you give and then regret it and then make it known that you regret it. There are occasions where you are not able to give charity, no matter how much you would want to, or how much somebody asks you to. And then you better say so, but in a nice way, rather than give it grudgingly and then spoil it. And Allah reminds us that He is rich and gentle. Now, 
There is quite a number of things in that particular selection of his attributes. On the one hand, he is rich, he doesn't need our charity. We do it for our own benefit. It's not even for the benefit of the recipient, it's for our own purification. He is in no need of anything, he is rich. But also by this combination, he is rich, he, he owns everything, yet he is gentle, he is not arrogant or aggressive or overbearing. So, there is no need for richness to go together with some kind of pride, as it often does. If Allah doesn't display that kind of pride, and He's got more than anyone, all is His, then why should we, when we should ra rather be grateful that He given us more than some others? So, we should have a gentle approach, and uh, be, be considerate and kind and forgiving. And coming back to the theme of the ayat before, Allah says again in ayat 264, O oh, you believers, do not spoil your charity with reproach and insult. Like the one, now he gives an example, like the one who spends his wealth to be seen by people and does not believe in Allah in the last day. His example is like that of a rock covered with soil hit by a torrent which leaves it arid. They have no power over anything they earn, and Allah does not guide ungrateful people. So, a reminder again saying, don't do that, because that is the characteristic not of a believer, to give and then follow it with reproach and insult, but it's the characteristic of the one who spends his wealth to be seen by people. He does it for show. A believer shouldn't do it for show. Somebody who wants to be seen and does not believe in Allah in the last day. In other words, the disbeliever or the hypocrite. They would behave like that. It is not befitting behavior for a believer to do that. So you must be very careful because it's so easy, you know, to sometimes hold a favor against a person. One has to be very careful there because that is not befitting behavior for a Muslim. And Allah gives us this example that makes us understand that that kind of giving is worthless. He says it's like that of a rock covered with soil. Now if it's a rock which has a little bit of soil on it, the soil doesn't go deep. Consequently anything that grows on there doesn't have deep roots, it doesn't go deep either. If it's hit by a torrent, meaning a heavy uh, downpour, it leaves it arid. In other words, it washes that bit of soil off and there is just rock left. That example, used in the example of Sadaqah, yes, you might have given something, you wanted a reward for it, but your insult that you made it follow with, washes it all off, your reward's gone, there is no reward. It's been like you've never given it at all. There is even, yeah, it doesn't last, there is even less there now than there was before. Instead of uh, making something grow, you had it washed away and you have, uh, rather than a reward, you actually have uh, added, added a sin to it. And what's, what's there is, is arid, it's nothing, it's all dried out. They have no, meaning those people who give to be seen by people, who give and then add reproach. They have no power over anything they earn. So, earn here, of course, not in the sense of earning wealth, but earning reward. Um, they cannot get anything from, they can, they can spend as much as they like, it will not bring them any blessings, any reward, any, any benefit, it will not make them pleasing to Allah. If you, you can spend millions for show and it's worth nothing. 
nor even can you buy the loyalty of people because even people when you give them with that attitude they don't respect you for it and Allah does not guide ungrateful people why are they called ungrateful here because they've got enough to give but don't have the humility to give it with so they are not grateful to Allah for what he has given them but they expect gratitude from people whom they give and that of course doesn't match, it's an imbalance. To, to give and want something back and at the same time not appreciate that Allah gave without counting. That is where the uh, ingratitude uh, comes in. Of course the term is the same as, of course Allah doesn't guide disbelieving people or you could, you could um, uh, apply it in either way because ingratitude to Allah is of course rejecting his favor and his disbelief it is sometimes difficult to to um, express the Arabic term that each each term implies a whole connection with the word family and each term naturally implies a whole philosophy almost you can't express it in one term so you have to choose the most appropriate and thereby exclude others when you translate and so in the context of this maybe ungrateful is the best term but then you're missing the bit that ingratitude to Allah is also a rejection and that a rejection of his favor is a rejection of the truth and therefore a disbelief if you just use disbelief you're missing the point that it has to do with being ungrateful and you really you can explain that but you can't necessarily express it equivalent, uh, in, in an equivalent uh, way in, in another language on the other hand in ayah 265 Allah says that the example of those who spent their wealth seeking the contentment of Allah and to strengthen themselves is like that of a garden on a hill hit by a torrent and it gives double its produce and if it is not hit by a torrent and by a drizzle and Allah sees what you do so he gives as a contrast the example that if you spend in the right way what do you get first of all to spend in the right way is to seek the contentment of Allah not your own benefit nor even the um, anything to do with the recipient because it's, it's important to realize here that, that giving charity has very little to do with whom you give it to you don't give it for a purpose you don't give it because you want to achieve something with it but actually you give it according to need somebody needs it you give it it's not given for an ulterior objective it's given so that Allah is pleased with your giving and you give it to whoever asks or needs it rather than connecting it to any other objective the sole objective should be that Allah is pleased with us and Allah says it strengthens the giver yeah, to uh, those who spend their wealth seeking the contentment of Allah and to strengthen themselves so we learn that charity besides the reward from Allah has another positive impact on us it is good for us and it is good for us because it strengthens us. How does it strengthen us? It strengthens us in, in, in faith because it puts, it, it translates an intention into reality. It is a form of implementation of faith. That is why zakat and sadaqa are such important aspects of Islam because expressing a belief verbally is one thing giving up something that is meaningful or useful or dear to us means a different level of commitment 
And if you are prepared to do that, if you are able to actually sacrifice for the sake of your belief, then your belief gets strengthened by it. So, it makes you help that step from an intention or just a loose verbal commitment to a solid commitment where you actually live the faith. And it has many other, of course, positive effects. It overcomes one's um, own greed. As Allah says elsewhere, whoever overcomes his own greed, those are the successful. It, it teaches us uh, to put spiritual values above material values. It enables us not to be too attached to material belongings. And so in many ways it is often a, a, a tangible benefit to the giver. Now, people who do that, Allah uses a similar example, but this time it's not a rock with a little bit of soil on it, but it is actually a garden on a hill. Why a garden on a hill? Why not just a garden? Because we now get the similarity and the difference. The similarity is that the rock covered with a bit of soil and the proper hill, not rock underneath, but proper soil underneath, but a mound and a garden grows on it, outwardly they look the same. You can't tell the difference. So the guy who gives for show and the guy who gives to please Allah, then he puts his money in the box or he drops something into the hat of the beggar or he finances whatever project. You can't tell the difference really. The difference is in the result, not in the appearance or not always in the appearance. And also, it gets hit by a torrent. Again, exactly the same as the previous one. So, it gets put to the test. Both charities have involved the same act of giving and then are subject to the same outward influences. But one prospers and one doesn't. Because one is pure and solid and the other one is just on the surface. So this one doesn't get washed off and leaves the barren rock. But instead that torrent fertilizes it, it gives double its produce which some understand as meaning it gives twice as much produce as it would normally. Others say it gives produce twice in a year instead of just one season. There are two fruiting seasons. So that kind of giving is like a garden that is in such a favored spot and position that when it gets hit by the strong rain it doesn't just produce ordinary fruit, but it does so double. And even if it isn't hit by a torrent, then by a drizzle. So even if it doesn't get full proper water, just a little bit is sufficient to bring out some of its benefit. And Allah sees what you do. Now, this qualification of, well, if it doesn't get hit by a torrent, um, is an indication that not all charity, if genuinely and sincerely given, always has a grand effect. Not all of it has these 700 times uh, at least not effect in this life, never mind the reward is, is a different story how Allah counts, but 
um, some of it will be extremely beneficial and prosperous. Some of it may only have a limited effect, but what matters is that it's been given cleanly and it's not wasted. Even if there is just a little drizzle, it will bring some fruit, it will not be wasted. Because of course we don't know, and that distinction is important, we don't know when we give charity whether what we give it for was the most appropriate cause. Sometimes you give and you actually give to somebody who A really needs it and B really does something with it. And so it has an ongoing benefit. Sometimes you give charity to somebody who maybe you thought he needed but he doesn't. You can get it wrong or who doesn't make good use of it. But that doesn't waste your charity, it doesn't make it useless and, and, and dried up like in the other case because you still get your reward and it still strengthens you, it still benefits you. Uh, so even in that case there is a result because Allah is aware, He sees it if nobody else. You don't need to show people if you give charity like that. Allah sees what you do or some, some uh, variant of reading is sees what they do. Um, as uh, uh, um, whether it, this is just addressed to the believers, yeah, or whether it's addressed generally. Then in Ayah 266, Allah gives us another example, and He sticks with that pattern or, or that, that um, theme of the garden. And of course that ayah does not necessarily only relate to charity, but generally about not wasting your effort. So it could refer back to those who follow their charity with reproach, or it could generally be for people who do good deeds and then waste them or uh, who, who uh, uh, are believers and then, then uh, turn away from it or whatever. Allah says, would any of you like to have a garden with date trees and grapevines, with rivers flowing through it? And he has all kind of fruit in it and old age hits him whilst he has weak children. Then a fiery tornado hits it and burns it. This is how Allah makes the signs clear to you so that you ponder. Um, First, Allah draws that picture of what of course anybody would like to have. A garden with date trees and grapevines. Why date trees and grapevines? Because they are amongst the most precious fruit trees. Date palms, grapes. So it's not just any ordinary garden, but it's the best you can get. Yeah, It's got everything. It's got water supply, rivers run through it, and it's got, as he says, all kind of fruit. Nothing's missing. Perfect. Would you like to have everything? Yeah? The perfect life. You've got all the material belongings you could wish for. But then comes the downside. And you get old, so you can't really do much with it anymore and you have weak children, so they're still dependent on you, so they can't help you. They're not old enough to pick it up. And there comes the catastrophe, it all gets destroyed. It gets destroyed by a fiery tornado that hits it and burns it. Now, fiery tornado, well, the, the, the term is a, um, well, some say it's the wind that gathers the cloud, like the gusty, you know, wind. Some say it's uh, the one that, that brings the thunderstorm and the weather. And, and the theory really, um, it means there is fire in it. But really, you don't get w fire in the wind. But, but the meaning is fire and extreme cold, freezing, are of a similar type. Yeah? The extreme cold can burn and the extreme heat can burn. They both also described as punishments of hellfire. 
extreme heat, extreme cold. So an icy cold wind destroys crop just as bad as a, a, a scorching hot wind would. So theory really can mean both extremely hot or extremely cold. It burns it up. It destroys it. So nothing's left of that crop. So here you have a scenario of somebody who's built everything in this life. And then the time comes because he's old where he would like the fruit of his achievement but he can't have it because he gets destroyed. Yet nobody can support him because his children are weak and still in need of his support rather than being able to support him. Some relate this parable to this world. Somebody who is fooled by the blessings of this world then gets old you could even think of those people who have everything and then all pay it for cancer treatment or whatever, you know. All their wealth goes because their life disappears. Um, some relate it to the next world saying, well, in the next world he will have nothing and can't rely on anybody, can't rebuild it because if, if he was still young he could start over again, digging the soil, making the garden good again. If his children were old enough, they could do it and he could sit back and enjoy it. But he can't, he doesn't get a second chance. Just like if you wasted your effort in this life, you don't get a second chance in the hereafter. You can't come back and do it again, it's over. There are many um, comparisons or many, many uh, aspects to this parable. But it's the worst situation you could be in. That you build something for your future, for your retirement as it were, and then it disappears in front of your eyes and there's nothing you can do about it. You've wasted all your effort. Now those people who give charity and then do it for show or follow it by reproach and insult, they waste their effort, their charity. It brings them nothing. Those people who do good deeds and then turn into disbelief, all their life's work is wasted. So it's an example of somebody who you know, becomes a hypocrite or a disbeliever after having believed as well. Those people who put all their effort into this world and have nothing left in the hereafter, it fits that as well. So there is many, many uh, ways of pondering and, and uh, using this analogy, but it is the worst case scenario. You have what everybody dreams of and in one go it's destroyed. This is how Allah says he makes his signs clear to you so that you ponder. He wants us to think about that. Is it worth it striving for this or for that? And what happens if Isn't it better to spend your time striving for something else that has a more lasting uh, benefit to us? Isn't it better instead of trying to create the perfect wealthy life for yourself and then see it disappearing in front of your eyes to maybe give the charity and ensure that whatever you give is stocked up as reward for you in the hereafter and nobody can take that away from you. So there are many things that we should think about. That uh, Allah gives us examples of real life stories as it were so we understand what can happen. You can see in somebody's life you think, oh dear we, I always wanted to be like that, now look what happened. A bit like um, Karun, when everybody was jealous of him with his wealth 
and then the earth swallowed him up and they all thought yeah well uh, don't want to be in his place now so Allah gives us these these examples so we learn from that rather than making the same mistakes that we ponder about the possibilities rather than blindly following somebody else's lead and ending up just as bad so again Allah encourages us and almost here it becomes an order that's why some people dis say this relates to the compulsory zakat in ayah 267 Allah says O you believers spend of the good things you have earned and what we let come out of the earth for you and do not try to spend the bad of it which you wouldn't want to receive yourselves and know that Allah is rich and praiseworthy um, here it is an instruction to spend and that's why people say it deals with zakat and it also lists what you have to spend from effectively there are two categories one is which you have earned in other words the fruit of your labor you do a work you get a wage or you do some work and you get a result you build something you construct something and the other is what Allah brings out of the earth for us which splits into effectively plants on the one hand agriculture and mineral resources or rare metals or whatever on the other be it petroleum yeah, that you get out of the earth or gold and silver or whatever else there is so whether you have got something through your labor or by simply finding it or exploiting in a quarry or growing it on a field you have to give its share in charity or rather in zakat and of course you would now in the tafsir deal with all the different proportions of how much in which case which I shan't go into because that is an issue of fiqh that really doesn't necessarily uh, benefit us here in, in trying to understand the gist of the ayat but these are the sources of our wealth we achieve them either by putting work in and getting a return or by growing things on the earth or by exploiting what is available in the earth already as resources each of that is a blessing Allah gives us and that we must teach by giving a share of it to others to those categories of the needy who are entitled to it and coupled with this instruction to give comes another condition and that is do not try to spend the bad of it which you wouldn't want to receive yourselves so when you give give from the best so if you were to have some crop and some of it is damaged that's not where you give your zakat from you give it from the good stuff if you have livestock and some of it is ill you don't give the ill one in zakat you give the sound one you only give what you would be happy to receive extremely important principle you don't give what you say ah, I wanted to get rid of that anyway let somebody poor have it this is not charitable people who are in need have dignity in Islam and they are not there for you to dump your junk on them what you give should be of 
the same sort of or if you feed people you shouldn't feed them a meal that you wouldn't want to eat you should feed them a decent meal just like you would eat the, 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 the term that I've translated as what you wouldn't want to receive yourself literally it says what you wouldn't take without frowning at it so if somebody gave it to you it's like what's this I'm not going to pay full, full price for that I won't take it unless you give it to me free or you know discount or whatever I mean something that you would not happily take at full value that's not the stuff you should give you give from that which is sound and of proper value and again Allah says he is rich and praiseworthy Allah is not in need of what you give if you want reward from him you do it for yourselves and if you want good reward make sure you give the best and all praise belongs to Allah and we've dealt with that when we give something we got to remember that we don't even give because we have but because Allah gave us so we must praise him that he's enabled us to have enough to give rather than think oh yeah I, I got stuff I can give it's, and feel great about it in ayat 268 Allah shows us that topic from yet another angle he says the devil promises you poverty and commands you indecency and Allah promises you forgiveness from himself and abundance and Allah is generous and knows so there are two conflicting calls upon us as humans where we can either go this way or that way we can either follow the call of the devil or the call of Allah the devil wants to when, when Allah says promises he means threaten promises you poverty means threatens you with poverty he tells you well don't give because you won't have anything left be stingy you need it you might need it later hoard it now um, the Prophet always gave in a way that he had no fear of poverty not worried about what he was going to get from where the next day his generosity was like that because there is a trust in Allah of course we have other ayahs that tell us that we should have a measure in giving we should not hold back too much nor give such that we ourselves become destitute but the point is we shouldn't get into that mindset where you think oh no no if I do this if I do that I can't afford if I spend that what's gonna happen and be forever worried that's from the devil and the other thing the devil does he wants us to do things that aren't right commands us with indecency and indecency is anything that is not proper not right whether it is the reproach and insult mentioned earlier or whether it is any uh, transgressions against the rules of Allah so the mindset that the devil puts on us is a selfish one one where we worried about things being taken from us and one where we overstep the mark by doing things we shouldn't be doing so we don't put self-restraint on ourselves and we seal ourselves off against anybody else sharing or infringing it's a mindset of on the one hand self-gratification we want things and on the other hand denying others whereas the mindset that Allah wants us to have he promises us forgiveness 
and abundance. The abundance offsets that fear of poverty. There is always enough. There is plenty. Allah has plenty. He can make sure everybody gets. He says in other ayats, look at the birds. They eat every day without worrying about where it's going to come from. He feeds everybody. There is no need to be unduly worried. And also, he offers forgiveness. If we transgress unintentionally, he forgives us. So he wants us to have a mindset where we are open, be ready to give because there is plenty. If I don't need something now and somebody else says, give it to him, when I need it, somebody will look after me because Allah takes care of that. No need to hoard it and think I might need it in 20 years time. Who knows? I can't give it to this poor fellow. Give it to him. In 20 years time, you might be around, you might not. Who knows? Allah will look after you. Be generous, be forgiving, Allah will forgive you. It is an open-minded attitude, one that puts other people first. And where we worry more about our mistakes than about our enjoyment. And where we don't worry about our lack of material wealth out of fear of poverty, but freely give because we are sure that Allah won't uh, make us destitute. So these are the two options that we have, and we have a choice. And Allah says, he, he, again, he, he mentions the two characteristics of his own, that he's generous and he knows. So, we have a choice that if we take the right choice, then it will be well rewarded. Unlike the devil who will just fool us. And Allah knows also what our needs are. And then, a extremely important ayah, 269, which kind of totally relativates the material attitude that is here described as coming from the devil. And by negating it simply says, wealth isn't everything. In fact, it means very little. Allah says, he gives wisdom to whom he pleases, and when someone has been given wisdom, he has been given a lot of good, but only those with understanding appreciate it. Now, of course, there are different uh, variations of readings as well. When, when I say someone has been given wisdom, it depends on uh, who has been given. Some read uh, and some read uh, um, there are different readings that say, or, or, or even no, uh, uh, tell, uh, we give him, whom we give wisdom, or whom he gives wisdom. It means the same, really, but there is a slight variation there. But, but the key theme of this ayat, especially if we compare it to many ayats that tell us that this world is only a limited benefit. Mata'un khalil, yes, it's only, it's, it, it's not valuable, it's not worth much in the sight of Allah. On the other hand, he says, if somebody's been given wisdom, he's been given a lot of good. So that counts a lot with Allah. In this ayat, really, Allah says, What really counts is not what you have, but what you are. And that is something you cannot acquire. You can acquire wealth, but it doesn't count much. But you can't acquire wisdom. You can acquire knowledge, but if you can't put the knowledge to good, new, good use, that's not wisdom. 
wisdom you cannot learn. It is given. Allah gives it to whom He wants. It's a blessing, it's a gift from Him. And He only gives it to those who understand. Because only those who understand appreciate it. So only those whom Allah favors will have the right attitude to life. Only those will be able to see the value rather than just the price of things. Will understand that giving is more valuable than hoarding. Wisdom is um, described as that which enables you to prevent folly or ignorance. To prevent making foolish mistakes. And in that it's distinct from knowledge, because knowledge in itself does not prevent you from anything. You may know a lot of things, but unless you have the wisdom of how it fits in and apply it right, that knowledge cannot save you. Just because you know a field very well doesn't mean you can take the right decisions. Of course, knowledge is important. But we've only been given a little bit of knowledge. Our knowledge is always limited. But wisdom is to draw the right conclusions from that limited knowledge for the benefit of correct action and to prevent and avoid doing the wrong thing or something foolish or causing damage to ourselves. And that wisdom, of course, comes with experience. Knowledge you can learn in theory. Wisdom is the benefit of practice. By acting, you become able to receive the wisdom Allah wants to give you, if He does. Whereas, mere theoretical study does not do that for you. So, this ayat also contains an endorsement that you must live your faith, not just learn about it. It is not good enough to study it and be, well, a scholar, a theoretical scholar of Islam. You know all about every little rule, but that doesn't mean that um, you can apply it to your own life. That requires a different characteristic and that's why often it is also said you can't simply learn Islam just from the textbooks. You have to learn from example. You learn from somebody else's example if you have a good teacher or sometimes from your own mistakes or successes. But you have to have that experience. Of course wisdom often stands for many different things. I mean. Uh, it's often a term used for the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as well because after all wisdom permeates his example, his life. He is the best teacher and you can pick it up from there. But it is a general ability that Allah blesses people with if He wants to and that is more valuable than anything because that is a quality that becomes part of yourself, of your personality that you take with you as well. It might be destroyed, it might disappear, uh, you might have to leave it behind. So with this ayat Allah says, what's your problem about giving? And why should you listen to the devil being worried about poverty? What's your attachment to material wealth? When it means so little. It has no value. The real good, if you want to have something real good, it's wisdom. It's what you are, not what you have. What makes you a person is not what you have, but the, the capability, the ability within yourself. And that is really valuable. So if Allah gives you that, then you got something. Allah gives you wealth doesn't mean he's blessed or favored you a great deal because in itself unless you use it wisely 
it means nothing. So wealth is there as a test. But wisdom is there as a tool. But unless you are endowed with that wisdom, you don't even grasp that concept. So materialistic people are too ignorant even to understand that their materialistic wealth in itself means little. And so they continue to run after it, because only those with understanding appreciate it. In Ayah 270, Allah says, Whatever you give and pledge, Allah knows it. And the wrongdoers have no helpers. Here we continue on the theme of charity and it is split in now two categories that which you give and that which you pledge thereby making it clear and of course that must relate again to the voluntary rather than the uh, obligatory zakat to the voluntary charity that giving and of course charity is more than just giving wealth but we're talking about wealth here of course we know from the hadith that charity is also any good deed even greeting somebody with a smile or making peace between people and so on but charity is not limited to those who have it is also permissible to pledge charity for the future. The intention is as important as the actual giving. Provided, of course, that when you have it, you give it. So, you might not be able at this moment in time to support a particular cause you would want to support. But it is perfectly alright to say, if I get this job, and then I have this income, I will then give that and that much to this and that course. I can't do it now, I want to, but at the moment I haven't got it, but the moment I get it, I will give. That is as acceptable to Allah as the giving itself, provided you carry it through. So if then, you get this job and you give, you have given a charity. If you don't get it, you still get rewarded for that intention that you would have given if you had it. Thereby Allah balances it out that the reward is not just for the rich people. Because what is important in giving is not the amount, but the willingness. And even people who don't have, can have that willingness of giving and only that they don't have stops them. So a pledge is added here to what you give. Allah is aware of it and how sincere and how genuine you are. And He doesn't just limit that opportunity to those who have a lot. On the other hand, He says the wrongdoers have no helpers. Those who follow the devil in his invitation to be selfish, they be left on their own. They be ultimately abandoned. In this world and the next, certainly in the next there is nobody speaking up for them, assisting them, putting a word in for them. So. On that basis that Allah knows what you give and pledge, we then come to ayah 271 that indicates to us that because Allah knows we don't need to tell anybody. So he says, if you give charity openly, then this is excellent. And if you hide it and give it to the poor, that is better for you. And it will undo some of your bad deeds for you, and Allah knows what you do. Allah knows, so you don't need to tell anybody. So there are two types of charity, or charitable giving. 
openly and secretly. Allah doesn't say don't give openly. And again, uh, to clarify, most Mufassirin of the opinion that this relates again to the voluntary charity. The compulsory deeds are best done openly. Like you have to go to the Jummah prayer, you do that in public view. But your tahajjud you best do at home. So the voluntary additional nawafil deeds are best done without anybody knowing. You don't have to go in the marketplace to pray to Hajj, so everybody thinks, oh, he prays a lot. The zakat you should give openly because there shouldn't be a doubt whether somebody has given it or not given it. Everybody has to give it. But your extra charity that nobody needs to know. You do that without wanting thanks for it. So this preference applies to the voluntary, not to the compulsory, which anybody has to do anyway, and which should be common knowledge. Even then there is nothing wrong with openly giving charity. So, if, asked, if somebody begs in public and you give something, everybody sees it, no harm. But the best charity is the one that nobody but you and the recipient and Allah knows about it. So, open charity is excellent, but if you give it quietly to those who need it, that is even better, better than excellent. Because the extra reward, you see, if you give your charity openly, some of your reward goes, gets lost, by the praise people might give you. They say, oh, well, he's generous, he's done this, look at what he's done. And it destroys, even if you don't, didn't intend that, it destroys some of it. Whereas, what you give just for Allah, it has its full value and therefore it undoes some of your bad deeds. It is more efficient. You give something, but you don't get anything back, even if you didn't want to. And so it's purely for Allah. He purifies you more. This concept is an extremely important concept in Islam. You can go into some, let's say, of the uh, old mosques, or other libraries or Islamic architecture buildings. And you may find that the artisan who, let's say, carved the arches or whatever, yeah, or put the ornaments there, or did the mosaic, put the most elaborate and most beautiful piece of work into a place where you can't see it. And you think, why, why that? Why not display it? Why not show it? Why put such a beautiful piece of artwork where nobody sees it? Not that the rest isn't beautiful, but the masterpiece is hidden. This comes from that understanding that you should give your best at all times, but your very best should be reserved for Allah's pleasure alone. You shouldn't do it for the praise of people. You shouldn't put it on display so people say, what a wonderful artist, how knowledgeable, how skilled, because after all, he's only doing it for Allah and he's only using the skill Allah has given him. So the best piece is for the reward by Allah alone. He doesn't want praise from people for it. So he does his very best in a place nobody sees it. The pure dedication as an act of worship rather than a mixture of worship and mundane or, or uh, a temporal uh, benefit. And that is the attitude that, that you do your best when nobody sees it. You excel not not when people looking, I mean, the exact opposite 
of today's whatever you call them, spin doctors or whatever, or, or the media uh, um, advertising, where they put the best in the showroom and the reality isn't quite like that. They put up a facade, a pretense. Even in the houses in uh, uh, Muslim towns, it used to be such that the beautiful garden was in the back and the front was plain. So people wouldn't get jealous. People wouldn't get, uh, you know, uh, feel intimidated by what you've got and they haven't got. You put all that out of sight. Uh, rather than putting up a facade, you've got the real thing where nobody sees it, but you know you've got that. You don't display it. You don't brag about, you don't boast about your capabilities and so on and so forth. It's a completely different attitude because after all we do it for love. We don't do it for the acknowledgement of people. And that is so very different between a spiritual society and a materialistic society. Because really these ayats, we had the devil warning, uh, inviting us to this and Allah inviting us to that. These ayats set off the difference between the charitable nature of a spiritual society guided by wisdom and on the other hand the indecent materialistic uh, selfish nature of the the mundane materialistic society guided by greed it sets these two against each other is very powerful set of ayats in that respect Now, in Ayah 272, also very interesting, Allah says, Their guidance is not up to you, but Allah guides whom He pleases. And any good you spend is for your own selves, and you only spend to seek the presence of Allah. And any good you spend will be repaid to you, and you will not be wronged. Extremely important Ayat, because this tells us that when we give, we must not scrutinize the recipient. From this ayat we understand you can give charity not just to Muslims, but to people of the scripture, to the polytheists, if they need it. And again, this is not dealing with the zakat, but with the charity. Because their guidance is not up to you. It's not up to you whether Allah guides them to the truth or not, whether they're Muslims or not. And you don't give it with the objective of them being guided. You give it because they might need it, and you give it for your own purification. Allah guides whom He pleases. And whatever good you spend, it's for your own good self, it's for your benefit. And you achieve that irrespective of who the recipient is. So if somebody needs help, you don't say, say Muslim, not a Muslim, you help. Somebody in need, you help. Irrespective of who it is, you don't go researching and say, hmm. Because what you give is for the reward of Allah. You only spend to seek the presence of Allah in your life. You want to be a tool of Allah, you want Allah to work through you. And he will repay you whatever any good you spend will be repaid to you and you will not be wronged. You get your full measure. You don't go and hire a private investigator to see what the guy who asks you for a bit of money does with it afterwards. Of course if you're sure that he's going to misappropriate it then that's different. But if you don't know you trust because you're not giving it and then police him after. It's a bit like reproach and insult. You don't become responsible. And that is something, unfortunately, a lot of people do. They give charity and then they start getting involved. As if they're responsible. Now that they've given, they must also watch what happens to it and make sure it gets spent like this and like that. And they start, uh, in a way, patronizing and, and, and dictating to people. They not just become somebody who gives and then lets somebody else get on with it, but they take over. That is not what you must do. You are not there to do Allah's job of guiding people whom He wants to where He wants. 
you only being tested as to your own willingness to respond to somebody's need or call. So we give in accordance to need, not with an ulterior objective. So if you go there and just give charity, which is what the missionaries do, we mustn't do that. That you give charity because you think, well, if I tie the charity to the faith, then people will become Muslims because they need the money. Yeah, just like in many Muslim countries they have tried to uh, convert people to Christianity because then they give them the facilities, the education, the clothing, the food. This is an abuse of charitable thinking. This is using it as an investment for another gain. This is materialistic application of charity. That is not what Allah is pleased with. Somebody needs it, you give it to them. If Allah wants to guide them, that's different. If they're interested in anything else, that's different. But you don't tie the two together. If somebody's hungry, you feed them and don't say, if you become a Muslim, I'll feed you. That is not appropriate. And then Allah tells us about a particularly worthy category of recipients in ayat 273. He says, for the poor who are constrained in the way of Allah, unable to travel on earth, the ignorant considers them to be rich due to their modesty. You can tell them by their sign. They do not ask people incessantly, and any good you spend, Allah knows of it. Most agree that this is specifically aimed at the Muhajirun, who left everything behind and were in need of the support by the Ansar of Medina, particularly the poorer of the Muhajirun, who were the Ahl Sufa, as who slept in the mosque who depended on handouts, who had no trade, no anything they could do. But of course there are people like that at any time, not just at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The poor who are constrained in the way of Allah, which there are two interpretations. On the one hand, they are constrained in the way of Allah, unable to travel on earth or unable to make a living on earth depending on how we read it because of their faith they've been expelled they are denied opportunities by those in power in their society who resent their belief so the Quraysh wouldn't give them wouldn't deal with them, wouldn't do trade with them, expelled them, took their goods. And of course, it would apply to anybody, let's say, who converts and loses his job, or doesn't get an opportunity because of his being a Muslim, or, yeah? The other interpretation of this constraint in the way of Allah is that they can't travel, trade, make a living, because they are involved in the jihad. That's the other interpretation of this. They deserve the support most, the charitable support. And they have certain characteristics. Allah says, the ignorant considers them to be rich due to their modesty. These are not people who go begging, not people who take advantage. They're too shy to ask. So unless you know about their situation, you don't even see that they need something, they hide it if they can. So if you're ignorant, if you don't understand what's going on, you think they're rich. Because they don't display their poverty. They act as if they don't need anything. They may be hungry, but they don't beg for food, so you think they got everything. But they don't. Allah says you can tell them by their sign, and there is lots of uh, suggestions of what that sign is. But it's not just like the mark of prayer because everybody has that. So it's got to be something specific. Whether it is that you can see their uh, hunger in their eyes or that you can see 
that they sleep rough or you can see that uh, they stay up and worry or you know lots of suggestions of what that sign is or whether it's their particular modesty or whether that sign is depending on whether we put a comma here or there actually the following part of the sentence that they do not ask people incessantly whether that is the sign but if you split that then the sign is something else but what we learn from this and that of course doesn't just apply to this category of people that if you're not ignorant you can tell what category people belong to by looking at their appearance there are telltale signs that tell you what the situation of somebody is if you have that wisdom so if you see a beggar, beggar in the road you can tell whether he's actually there making business or whether he's genuine or whether even you see somebody and he's not begging but you know he's in need you see a traveler stranded on an airport who doesn't want to ask anybody but you know they've got a problem and you can tell and you can go and help them without them asking because there are signs you can pick up the vibes as we say you can pick up certain indicators of what situation somebody is in that's a very important statement as well you don't have to wait till somebody asks in fact these people they don't ask people incessantly meaning again and again they don't beg, they don't go, go on please, can't you know? I mean, not like some beggars I've met who, uh, you know, they ask for something and then you give them something, you say, what, only that? Can't I have more? You know, not like that. Um, or who set their own price, you get that as well. Um, almost like a tax. Um, they don't persist. And of course from that again, we get rules that if you have to ask ask once or ask three times the most because the person whom you ask might only decline because he, he hasn't got and he doesn't want to say and you embarrass him that he can't give there's no point asking it again and again asking somebody who doesn't want to give is stupid and to continue asking somebody does, who wants to give but can't is just as stupid, so why? But here we have people who, well, when Allah says they don't ask people incessantly, um, some say, well, they don't ask at all. Some say they only ask and then resign themselves to whatever answer they get. So again Allah says, any good you spend, Allah knows of it. So here he singled out the most needy of people. They are the people who because of their faith are prevented from earning their own living. And they need to be looked after. And they have a right to be looked after and it is our duty and Allah is aware of if you do that and rewards it accordingly. Finally on this section of Sadaqah, Ayat 274, those who spend their wealth night and day secretly and openly they will have the reward with the Lord and shall have no fear nor be sad this ayah that sums up that section basically adds yet another element to all the things that have been said and that is make it a habit if you want to be a one, amongst the ones who want to be rewarded by Allah who don't want to be worried about the future or regret the past who want to be content in Allah's presence then make a giving a habit because that's what's expressed in this phrase they give night and day secretly and openly giving spending of their wealth of what they have comes natural to them they don't have a set time for giving only give at the time of when the zakat is being collected or only give on Eid or only on Juma or they don't have a set time in fact it doesn't matter any time of the night or the day they don't think about it 
they have something, there is somebody who needs it, they give. They're always ready to support whatever they can support, if it needs supporting. They do it openly, they do it secretly. It's just a way of being that you consider giving more important than receiving or having. You don't hesitate. You're being asked, you give. You give without being asked. It's in public, you give. It's when nobody sees it, you give. Because this is ultimately the gratitude of appreciating that Allah has given you more than you need. And so you are honored and pleased that you are able to part with it and share it. So after all these different ideas of how to give, how not to give, whom to give to, what the benefits are, what the approach should be, the philosophy behind it, what is the real wisdom, Allah sums it up and says, make it second nature. And you have nothing to worry about. Night and day, open secretly, you will get your reward from Allah and you needn't fear about anything nor be sad about anything. So very very powerful support of if you want to be living up to what Allah wants from you, if you want to be in His good books, if you want to live in His presence, if you want to please Him, then you should be charitable all the time. Alhamdulillah.